The Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television. Hello, this is Morgan Halgren. For 16 seasons, Living in Iowa told the tale of what it means to be uniquely Iowan. Tonight, we honor that spirit by bringing you another glimpse into our rich heritage with a few stories from our archives. In this episode of The Best of Living in Iowa, we explore the life and times of Iowa artist Grant Wood, explore a kidney transplant story that is more than skin deep, and follow one man's dream to celebrate the spirit of giving. Hello, I'm Morgan Halgren. Thanks for joining us for the first show of Living in Iowa's 16th season. Once again, we're looking forward to sharing the stories of a whole host of interesting Iowans. Like Grant Wood, in the decade between 1924 and 1934, the famed Iowa artist lived in Cedar Rapids enjoying a surge of creativity. The result, American Gothic. 75 years later, it's considered by many to be America's most familiar painting, and it's back in its hometown as part of a once-in-a-lifetime exhibit. I'm here at the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, and like a lot of other people, I'm taking advantage of a rare opportunity to see Grant Wood's masterpiece, American Gothic. I showed you the Gothic. Can you make a Gothic with your fingers, your hands? He made the Gothic window. Terry Pitts is the executive director of the museum. Terry, it's such a thrill to have the painting here. When was the last time it was in Iowa? It was more than a decade ago. It was in, a, in an exhibition at the Davenport Museum of Art in the early 1990s. Why is this painting such an icon? Well, it, first of all, it's a great painting. When you look at it really closely, it's just wonderfully painted, and it's, uh, there's a lot of detail and a lot to think about. But I also think that it's ambiguous, so people can read into it their own experiences, their own vision of the Midwest and the people that are there. There was some controversy as to whether it was a father and daughter or husband and wife, and that was actually a big controversy, wasn't it? It, it was. Um, he never offered it a definitive answer, and I think that's part of the, the enduring pleasure of the painting, is trying to figure it out for yourself. Well, can we take a look at some of the details that we might not understand that you could explain to us? Sure. Okay. Um, well, first of all, it's important to know just how carefully constructed it is. Grant Wood was a master at composition, and so there are a lot of um, repeating things that help the eye uh, look at this picture and see coherence. Every single thing was very carefully staged for him, because this is not a portrait of two people. It's sort of a fictional portrait of two people that he imagined owned this house with this wonderful Gothic window, which is so out of place. If there's anything that Grant Wood did in this painting um, that really sets it apart, it's the loving care with which he depicted everything. He was beginning to see how wonderful it was to be an Iowan and to have, uh, to appreciate everything that was around him that he never really thought was important, suddenly was really important to him. Is there any discussion about the little lock of hair that's left loose in the woman's very severe hairdo? Well, I just, I think that's one of the wonderful little touches, and it is the little touches that make this painting so interesting to look at. Um, everyone thinks that they are very tightly controlled people, and yet her hair is falling apart. The last thing I would say about the painting is try to imagine it without that wonderful fist. Um, I, in some ways, I think that is really the key to the painting. If you'd sort of cover it with your eyes, the painting is not nearly uh, as, as interesting. It's true, it lacks the sense of determination or something. Exactly. While American Gothic is the picture that made Grant Wood famous, it is not his only achievement. This special exhibit illustrates a broad swipe of this artist's work. Terry, tell us how this exhibit is organized and what's included. 
The exhibit is chronological. It starts with the Grant Wood's earliest works from when he was a high school student here in Cedar Rapids, and it goes to almost the last things that he produced just before he died in 1942. The focus of the show is the 10-year period when he lived here in downtown Cedar Rapids at the studio known as Five Turner Alley, and it's the time period when he made this dramatic change, when he went from being just another impressionist painter to you know, a really world famous uh, painter of a regionalist movement, but of a very, very uh, particular style and um, caliber that just sort of rose above the average. This part of the exhibition represents some of the unknown Grant Wood, the things he did for people's homes, the way he made a living, but he obviously he put his heart and soul into the to the um, commissioned works that he did. This pair of French doors for a private home. Um, for other people, he did wrought iron works. This uh, fireplace screen, very elaborate design uh, created for a private home. And then over it, um, a wonderful painting called Over Mantelpiece, which he did for the owners of that home and the family uh, standing outside in front. What is the significance of this painting? Well, this is really the first painting he does in his new style after returning from a significant trip to Munich, Germany in 1928. A couple of months prior, he was an Impressionist, but he goes to Munich and he has plenty of time to study the art there and he falls in love with the Northern Renaissance. And this is his version of a Northern Renaissance painting done in Iowa. Uh, it's a portrait of his mother in front of an Iowa landscape and its details show the things that he loves about Iowa and his mother, the cameo that he probably brought her from a, a European trip, uh, the plants that she carefully nurtured. Those become her attributes, the things that he admires about her. And he's attempting to tell a little bit of a biographical story through the other elements of the picture, where she lived, what she cares for, and uh, how much he loves her. Well, it seems appropriate by his self-portrait to ask, what do we know about the man, Grant Wood? Well, we know a few things. Um, he was a very persistent person uh, throughout his career. He had to have a lot of belief in himself. He never really had much fame or success commercially for, for 20 years as an artist. And then it sort of was one of those cases of overnight success. Um, he was a bit of a perfectionist. When you look at some of the other drawings like this, you see how carefully he plotted everything, very methodical. He did not produce a lot of art in his life, so he was very slow. Um, but at the same time, he had a wonderful sense of humor. He was apparently a great party goer, a party giver, and loved to play jokes. So I think everyone would have loved to have met him. I mean, we all look at these pictures and just would like to know him more. There's more to learn about Grant Wood in Cedar Rapids. The Cedar Rapids Museum of Art recently acquired the artist's studio, Five Turner Alley. It's just three blocks away from the CRMA, and it's open for tours. During our visit, we chanced upon Mindell Wagler Bushart, who told us she knew Grant Wood. She was one of his housekeepers when he lived in Iowa City in the late 1930s. Tell us why it was fun working for him. What kind of person was he? He was friendly. I never heard him say a cross word. And um, he was uh, quiet. He was uh, soft-spoken, his voice. And uh, he was just a nice man. Did you see him working often? Uh, painting? Yes. Oh, yes, when he had had easel in the bedroom, uh, I would watch him sometime. And uh, it all had to be perfect. He would paint, and then he would step back and wasn't good, he do it over and he was neat. He was a neat person. Meticulous, wasn't he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What observations would you make about what his life was like? Was he very socially active? He was. He had a lot of friends and he'd have them. He'd maybe cook up a big kettle of uh, vegetable soup and his mother would make uh, uh, pie and did have a good time. Well, I just wish I would have known him better then than I did. And uh, I wish he would know how great he is now. 
Terry, I've read that Grant Wood considered this his greatest work of art, this studio. Why would that be? Well, it combines so much of what he was really interested in and what he wanted to show in his life. He really believed in the sort of totality in creating both functional works that were beautifully done and creating works of art. And so here he was able to pull it all off to set the stage, to actually control everything, the view, the way that things worked. So within this 975 square feet, Grant Wood created a wonderful environment that embodied uh, both the simple functional objects, very well made, and wonderful pieces of art. And I just want to ask you personally, what does it feel like to know that you are in this place where this, so many masterpieces were created? Well, it's a little you know, awe-inspiring to be here, uh, partly because of what you know was done right here, that so many wonderful paintings were made here, that, that in a way art history was changed because of what went on in the studio with American Gothic and other paintings. But also you have this sense when you're here at different times of the day as we're privileged to be, or if you're here at night, what you see is that this is a place for light. And that's, I think, the magic of Five Turner Alley. It's about light. Grant Wood had windows and all four compass points. He had this wonderful cupola right above, and he stood in the middle with his easel. It's the perfect place for a painter. So American Gothic was painted in this room. That's right. Many people never seriously consider the idea of becoming an organ donor. Maybe they figure that the chances of being in that situation are just too remote. DeWitt Pollard didn't leave his decision to chance, and he didn't hesitate for a moment when he chose to offer a kidney to his friend, Terry Buckwalter. In the sports world, the heroes are easy to spot. They're the ones who put out the extra effort, sometimes even sacrificing their bodies for the good of the team. But in the real world, the heroes can be more difficult to identify. They tend to just blend into the crowd. How's it going? Thanks. DeWitt Pollard is a real world hero. When someone in need asked for his help, DeWitt stepped up and sacrificed his body for the good of a friend. You know, somebody needs help, you know, you dig in and you help them best you can, you know, because there's two ways of looking at things. You can complain about it, you know, point fingers and, you know, stand back and look, or you jump in and help, you know. Terry Buckwalter, or Bucky as his friends call him, is the owner of the Belgrade, a popular Moline tavern in DeWitt Pollard's neighborhood. We gotta get that route back up here? Uh, I, I'd like to for the summer, but I don't know if it's gonna happen before then or not. They're... The two have been casual friends for 20 years, nearly as long as Bucky has been battling kidney disease. But when his kidneys failed a year ago, both the battle and the friendship intensified. Well, when I started dialyzing, I came in the bar one day, I happened to mention. I said, you know, I'm on the kidney list now. I went to Iowa City and got on the kidney list. But I tell you what, they said it'd be about 18 months. I said, if anybody in my bar wants to give me a kidney, they can drink free the rest of their life. And I, I made that as a joke. And so uh, I had three or four people talk to me about it, and Dee was one of them. Uh, now we're even. <laughs> <laughs> kidney for a glass of water, we're even. That's fair. He's the only one that came back and said that uh, I'm really serious. DeWitt, who is more likely to enjoy a soda than a beer, made his offer out of friendship rather than thirst. That's cool, but no, let me know if that's... After rigorous testing and screening, doctors at the university hospitals in Iowa City concluded that the two had enough in common to be declared a match. But their surgery would prove to be anything but common. While interracial transplants from cadaver donors are relatively common, theirs would be the hospital's and perhaps the state's first kidney transplant between a live donor and recipient of different races. I know a lot of people probably are gonna make this a blithe white issue. And it's really not to us. It's a friend, friend issue to us. I can't go out and wait for a black person, an Indian, or Oriental, or you know, or a Latin, or Latino, to say, "Oh, boom! Let me target it this way." You know, you don't, you know, you don't target help. 
When Dee told me about his kidney, I didn't think about Black White. I was just thinking about the kidney and if it'd work. And uh, I brought up in the west end of Rock Island, which is the minority section. I was just brought up where, you know, they're just like anybody else. I mean, there's good whites, there's good black. While Bucky's neighborhood was predominantly black, most of Dee's neighbors were white. No doubt familiarity played a part in the decision. But while their story is certainly one of racial rapport, it's just as much about second chances. DeWitt Pollard's life got off to a rocky start. His natural parents put him up for adoption early on. As DeWitt put it, they must not have wanted a third mouth to feed. But he got his second chance when he was adopted into a loving family. DeWitt says donating a kidney is his way of giving some of his good fortune back. I was uh, accepted by both sides of the family, and it never was part of the conversation, you know. I was a Pollard, you know, and uh, it's that, that in itself is fantastic, you know, that, uh, you, you know, you're that welcome, hands down. A kidney isn't all Dee's given up. Major surgery meant time off from work, and since this type of elective procedure was not covered by his sick leave, and his vacations had already been taken, DeWitt's only alternative was a leave without pay, which meant as many as six weeks without a paycheck. Yep, take care. I subsidized myself uh, by taking uh, a withdrawal from my 401k so that I would have money in bank so I could take care of, you know, just the standard uh, bills, you know, your groceries, your gas and light and all that stuff. But when the six weeks started looking more like eight or ten, the Quad Cities turned out for their hero. Moline's mayor declared Sunday, December 13th, DeWitt Pollard Day, and a pancake breakfast attended by perhaps a thousand people raised enough money to recoup his expenses. There's so many people reaching out, you know, doing so many nice things. It's, it's really going well. These days, the two men's lives are pretty much back to normal. Bucky's back behind the bar, and DeWitt's back behind the wheel. 20 blue, see the 20 sign up there? First one in line. Most nights, Dee's at the gym. He's got some getting in shape to do if he plans to both play and umpire baseball this summer. On the way home, he's likely to stop by the Belgrade. Stay on it. Dee and I both like sports. He's a Laker fan and I'm a Bulls fan. Got it. Look at that. A master at work. And uh, of course, I, last few years, I've got him. But this year, I think he's going to have me. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to change the subject and go to baseball. <laughs> there are some who say people can be measured by what they do with what they've been given. There it is. Good one. Catch you later. All right. Early in his life, DeWitt Pollard was given a second chance. And what he did with it will stay with his friend for a long time. Dialyzing and your kidney's going bad and feeling miserable all the time. It just isn't any fun. And then to get a break like that to feel, to feel normal again, it's just you just can't explain it. Good guy there. <laughs> He's my savior. <laughs> Set me free. <laughs> yep, a lot of misery. Yep. My granddaughters, I get to uh, see them grow up now, where before you'd never know. You never know when your time's up dialyzing. You never know how, how much your body can take. With uh, him adjusting to his medicines and whatnot, and the rejection medicines, that he, like I said, he can possibly get 20 years out of that kidney. You know, that's fantastic. That's what my prayers are now. You know, that uh, that it stays strong and active, and that it gives him a lot of years. After almost 27 years at IPTV, the tapes in our library are like a mosaic of meaningful experiences for me. The labels trigger memories of rewarding adventures and revealing interviews, each story with its own set of lasting images and words to remember. This week, we'll go back to 1991 to meet Jess Cross, who for many years managed to provide Thanksgiving dinner for thousands who might otherwise have gone without. There are a few things that happen with almost certainty in Corning, Iowa. For instance, you can count on, once the season opens, pheasant hunters being in town not only from across Iowa, but from out of state as well. You can be sure that Kay's restaurant will be packed on Friday nights for the all-you-can-eat chicken and fish special. You can also mark on your calendar the second Saturday in November as the day that Jess Cross has Thanksgiving dinner. And while that date might seem a little early for Thanksgiving, what is really unusual is the recipe that Jess follows. 
It begins with 48 turkeys. Next, take 180 pounds of dried breadcrumbs, 75 pounds of celery, and 65 pounds of onions, which is enough to make a whole kitchen cry. The recipe also includes 42 gallons of corn, a quarter ton of taters, 150 loaves of bread, 200 pounds of butter, and 250 gallons of coffee. Mix it all together, then invite anyone who cares to come. All that Jess asks is that you bring an appetite. Is it just the traditional Thanksgiving dinner? Yes, there'll be, uh, there'll be the 48 turkeys and then dressing, mashed potatoes, gravy, corn, and then uh, hundreds of pies. Hundreds of pies? Yes, so you'll, you'll see more pies than you've ever <laughs> seen in your life. It was in 1979 that Jess started inviting people to join him for Thanksgiving dinner. At that time, he enlisted the help of the National Guard, and they provided help in preparing the supper, as well as a place to hold the event. According to Jess, that first year brought around 300 people to the Armory in Corning, and since then, the annual supper has become a 48 turkey event. And the process starts all over again, 48 times. There's been times that I've been up, then I've been down, just about as hard down as any poor person could ever get. And there's been a few Thanksgivings that I've never had, so I know that if you got your, a good meal, you can be happy. And uh, I know basically everybody is equal. So if you can get them all in the same room under the same thing, and they just let their hair down, and you can't tell who's who, and then the banker might go out and he'll say, well, that was a pretty nice guy I talked to last night. Maybe when he comes in, I'll loan him something. You know, uh, you just might create an ap atmosphere that will better the whole town or, or the whole countryside, because it's not just Corning, it's all the areas. And we just repeat it 48 times. <laughs> It's been 12 years now, and Jess, with the help of the National Guard, is on his 11th annual supper. If you're wondering how it is that Jess is only on his 11th annual supper in 12 years, it's because things do happen with only almost certainty. Last year, with trouble in the Persian Gulf and problems with his health, Jess called off his supper. I can't give the National Guard enough credit. Um, I, uh, I just can't, because the fact is that Without them and their knowledge and their people, uh, this thing couldn't happen. For most of us, just inviting the relatives or a few friends over for Thanksgiving is enough to make us break out in hives. But try sending out an open invitation and not knowing how many might show up. And then you might understand how Jess could forget how to start his own truck. I forgot it. <laughs> now you ask me how excited I was, I forgot it. <laughs> or you might try inviting just 20 or 30 people and see what your spouse says. It should come as no surprise that to do this every year takes a lot of family support. 99.5% of it is all done by my family. They help me out tremendous, and uh, I couldn't do it without the family. For Jess, a big part of the supper every year is the pie contest. This year, over 150 pies were judged by 36 celebrity judges. Later that evening, those same pies were informally judged by the 1,500 people who came to supper. Is this your first year to come to the Thanksgiving yes. dinner? Yes. Is it? Yes. And what have you heard about it? That they have a lot of pies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are you guys looking forward to? Eating. Eating, Eating the pies? <laughs> supper is served at 5 o'clock, but at 4 o'clock, dinners are sent to the local nursing home and jail. To help with the costs of the event, Jess has worked for months to get as much donated to the supper as possible. Still, some things have had to be purchased, and to help cover those expenses, there's a box for donations at the head of the line. I have faith in it. all the people that come through here. I know they'll donate the ones that can will, and the ones that don't will. Those who could that didn't, they got to live with themselves, so I, I have faith in people. As people went through the line, it was evident that this year's crowd was smaller than the one two years ago, and that Jess had overestimated how much food was needed. We're down at least 1,500 people. It's, it was a disappointment, but not that much. It was good. We've served a lot of people, and we got a lot of people from Omaha, Des Moines. There was a lot of people here from, out, from away from here, so that, that's pleasing. I think more of the shut-ins, the elderly, 
didn't get here this year, and that was a big difference in our local people. Because they, they scare the eyes, and when you get older, you just hate to get out at night. But those people didn't show on account of the weather, I'm sure. Jess doesn't do his supper to make money. He can't afford to lose money on it either. This year, Jess did lose money, but he's still thankful. Thankful for what he's got, and thankful that it's enough that he can extend a hand to those who need it. So mark your calendar for that second Saturday in November and plan to attend next year. Jess will be having supper again with almost certainty, because Jess has a goal, and that's to serve as many people as live in Adams County, 5,000 of them. If they come to my door in flocks tomorrow, <laughs> I would, I'd give them what I had, but that wouldn't last long. But I think if you let anybody down in the community that you could have helped, then you're letting yourself down. Best of Living in Iowa is funded in part by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television.